I remember how to do this. I think I remember who all of you are. I sometimes look in the mirror and I wonder, who am I? And welcome to all of you who may be watching us today on this uh, transitional Wisconsin typical late fall day. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, rain or shine, uh, and be glad. So at this time, Patty, we need to forward the weather announcements we have. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning out there. We wish everyone a beautiful 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Are there any church announcements this morning? Brian? Yeah, I'd like to announce that the, the, the board has accepted a proposal from Alan Schumacher of Old World Restorations. Uh, he's Hopefully he's going to come out sometime this week. They're going to take apart this window up here by Mark, and you're going to find out what it's going to cost or what they're going to have to do to fix the rest of these windows. Uh, but hopefully he'll be coming out this week to take a look at that. And we have a council meeting this Tuesday at 4.30. Any other announcements this morning? Church council meeting Tuesday evening at 4.30, and uh, someone's coming out to look at the windows and hopefully restore our church windows. Remember to sell the tickets, chili tickets. Sell your chili tickets. We still have cookie bake on the 28th and 29th at 8.30 downstairs. All is welcome to come. And get in the door. <laughs> so please stand for our call to worship. We are here because we have heard the call of Jesus in our lives. We are here to challenge and support one another to rise up and follow. We are here because we want to be God's people. We come seeking to be moved, changed, and made whole by the Spirit of the living God. Let us open our hearts to the moving of the Spirit and prepare to leave this place as true disciples of Christ. Amen. Together, let's join in our opening prayer. Amazing God, you have shaped the world in wonder and mystery. With thanks, we contemplate the unseen world with all of its realities. You have created us so that we live as citizens of worlds seen and unseen. Help your creatures to live so that your spirit may become visible in our actions and relationships through the grace of Jesus Christ who shared our earthly life. Amen. Our opening prayer this morning, hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 21, or on the wall.
beforehand that God loves us. That God will continue to love us, his children. I think we can come to that awareness that we are indeed all loved by God, whether we are rich, poor, whether we find ourselves lost, whatever the case may be, that God is seeking to redeem and to restore and give joy and hope and happiness. That gives us the freedom to confess our sins, our human mistakes, knowing that God will love us. So in the spirit of confession, would you join together with me in our prayer of confession? Let's pray. Oh Christ, if we carry the name of Christian, we are a sign of your presence. Yet we confess that we sometimes hurt people through our pride, rather than showing the way to the healing waters of your spirit. When we are discouraged ourselves, we are unable to be signs of joy or hope or good news. Forgive us and give us grace to be earthly reminders of your love. Join with me in our assurance of pardon. The good news is that we don't have to depend on ourselves, but on the Spirit of God to give us vitality. Thanks be to God. Amen.
It is never, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you, cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of the clouds, the song of the ruthless was still. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, a well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Contemporary versions of this particular story within within the context of, this, of that. So it's Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent the disciples to him, along with the Herodians, and said, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought him a denarius. And with that, then they, they, they said to them, Whose head is on it? Whose title? And they said, The emperor's. Therefore, the emperor, uh, give therefore the thing to the emperor's. Uh, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. And he goes on then to talk about the importance of, of a banquet and being too busy for a banquet as a part of that text. So at this time, if I can get my laptop working properly, could I have the young people come up here with the clues? It's so 
Ta-ta! So sometimes we just get too busy, don't we? We just get darn busy. So, and as you get older, you're going to find busy. Oh, I don't have time to do that. But you know what? There are times we just have to be quiet. Like when we come to church, when we pray, or we take a walk, or whatever it is you do, that we can have conversations with God. And that's an important thing, okay? My name is Greg. Your name is Carl. Yeah, sure. Let me call it a lot of things in my life. Let's have a prayer, okay? And I thank you for these young people in their spirit. Love them. Uh, guide over them. Bless them. If you love text I'm actually preaching from is actually a portion that I didn't read uh, for Dennis this morning when I put this thing together. So bear with me. But uh, we're having some technical difficulties too here because my microphone, for those of you who are out there, a uh, the little red light's not on, so I'm not sure you're hearing this for whatever reason. So anyway, the little red light usually indicates we have power. So uh, whatever we do, we don't seem to have power, but anyway. So we'll continue on. Just get close to your, just get close to your, your your listening station. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? God, may the words which I am about to utter and the privilege that I now assume be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Now, I told David this morning that I promised to uh, start open with a story. We're going to be talking about banquets, actually, uh, where it's in a portion of Matthew's chapter 22 about kids' excuses. My guess is, Dave, or those of you who have taught, did you hear excuses from kids while they didn't have an assignment done? Standard procedure. Standard procedure. <laughs> Almost every time you had an assignment, uh, you should have written the book or written them all down, because somebody's got them down here, and I'm going to share a few. I think you get a kick out of them. And quite frankly, some of them are pretty creative. The Toronto Star invited teachers to submit excuses that they received from their students. They received these examples, a student explaining why he was late. I was kidnapped by aliens and interrogated for three hours. Uh-huh. Another student telling why he failed to turn in his essay. The bus driver read it and liked it so much. Now, Randy, you would never do something like that, would you? <laughs> no, no. Uh, he wanted to show his other passengers. Another, I got mugged on the way to school. I offered him my money, my watch, and my pen knife, but all he wanted was my essay. <laughs> uh -huh. Mike, a 14-year-old, came up with a watertight excuse for arriving at school an hour later. With his, with his pants soaked in the knees. I was just about to board the bus when I, I found that I'd lost my ticket. Since it would take too long to walk to school, I hopped a fence to the, the nearby golf course. I headed for a creek that crisscrossed the fairways, and I found a likely spot for lost balls. I retrieved three balls from their watery graves. I then made for the clubhouse where I sold the balls for bus fare. And that's why I'm late. Mike's entry one. Creative writer at some point, perhaps. A wealthy father planning an extravagant rehearsal dinner for his son's impending marriage. No expense was spared. An elegant dining room at the town's most elite hotel was engaged. Fresh lobster was flown in. The finest steaks were purchased. The finest linens were laid out in china and silver. An orchestra was hired and a valet service was arranged. And invitations were sent out to all the elite in the community. You were invited to a rehearsal dinner, RSVP. The father's surprise, though, dismay. Excuses came pouring in. 
Some of them were ludicrous. One man, a real estate speculator, had bought some property and needed to inspect it at night. Another couldn't leave his store. Others full of similar conflicts. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Not a single invitation was accepted. The father was angry. Those so-and-so will never get another invitation from me. He grumbled and then he sent some of his employees down into one of the worst sections of town and said to them, I'm going to have a banquet for my son. Take whoever will come. I don't care. Rich people, poor people, respectable people, why else? I don't care. I want that dining hall filled for the banquet. And his employees did just as they were bid. And that night, a festive occasion was had by all when they came to the rehearsal dinner. You might recognize that story as an abbreviated and updated version of Jesus' parable later on in the chapter, the 22nd chapter of Matthew. There's a modern day equivalent of that, though, and I, I've heard a couple of stories since this one uh, that appeared in newspapers, but this was some time ago. Kathleen Gooley was all set for her wedding. She had to cater. $4,000 non-refundable deposit for the reception, and suddenly found herself without a groom. Since she was out of the money for the caterer anyway, she contacted shelters for the homeless and drug rehab centers to compile her gift guest list. She figured someone, someone needed to enjoy the banquet. The obvious meaning behind Jesus' parable is that the righteous people of this day rejected Christ. Thus the Father opened the invitation of his banquet to all who would come. Righteous and unrighteous alike. Those who rejected the invitation didn't get a second chance. But to any who will come, the door is open. This is the obvious message of the parable. Now I don't believe that Jesus would mind, however, if we dealt for a few moments with the excuses all of us have to offer God at some point. Because we've all made them. Especially the most common excuse. I just don't have time. You ever use that one? You ever thought that one? I think probably everybody here has. It doesn't seem that most of our common complaints about life is that we don't have enough time. We try and squeeze as much as we possibly can into every day. Now, I'm going to get to you folks who may be retired just a minute. I'm going to address that as well. Because we are rapidly approaching the holiday season, some of you might get a chuckle out of this story. A young wife called the newspaper office one day. This is before you had Wi-Fi and Internet, the World Wide Web, all that kind of stuff. Um, and she, you know, where there's a lot of information and misinformation. Would you please help me, she asked the food desk person. I'm cooking a special dinner for my husband and my husband's boss and his wife. I've never cooked a big dinner before, and I want everything to be just perfect. I bought a nine-pound turkey. A nine-pound turkey. Now, that's not a huge turkey, but mind you, can you tell me, uh, Mr. Food Editor, how long it takes to cook my turkey in my, in my new microwave? Uh, just a minute, the food editor said. Now she turned to check his reference book. Oh, thank you, she said. You've been a big help. Goodbye. A minute. That's all she got. That's all she stayed for. I don't think I would want to touch that turkey. I'm sure she said, probably I thought, well, he can give us information. The holiday season seems to rush toward us. We used to love to find a way to prepare a nine pound turkey in just a minute, wouldn't we? Uh, that tasted good. Uh, or didn't make it sick. Many of you are retired. But even when you first retired, you thought, and maybe maybe this doesn't apply to you. If not, you can just kind of just stand right through this portion of my message. Gee, I've got all of this time, and now I can get around all of those projects I've, I've had to shelve during my working days. Now I'm going to travel and see the world and and do all these kinds of things, go to our national parks, whatever. But nature abhors a vacuum, doesn't it? And then if you find that you're still busy. When my parents were alive, I think they were busier 
after retirement, probably their social schedule, than they were prior to that. But they were still busy. There just isn't enough time for modern parents, especially mothers, either. In my research for this message, after reading the paper and getting some coffee in me, uh, perhaps I don't think I got enough, was to look at screen time, look at a screen, and came across this article. This is where much of our time is going during the pandemic. One could argue that social media and the internet is a lifeline, or it could be a black hole, depending on how you think about it. Um, but our screens that we look at take up more time than ever. Young or old, our time gets eaten up even during the pandemic. Now, how many of you sat down to do something, looked at, started looking through some stuff, maybe looked at social media, maybe go on to Amazon or some of your favorite sites, and you look like, oh my gosh, it's already this time? True confessions that ever happened to you? Yeah. But here's the, here's the, here's the story. More than half of Americans are suffering from screen fatigue during the COVID-19 pandemic, according to new research. A, a new survey of 2,000 Americans found 53% of the respondents are feeling burnt out on screens after a few months of this. The study showed that before the COVID-19 pandemic, the average American surveyed was getting about four hours of screen time per day. Now, I think in all fairness to some of us who you know, because we could be watching a movie and, and Grace would say, what are you doing? And I have to respond to uh, often a cop on the second shift or something, and it's business related, so mine is kind of just scattered throughout sometimes. Uh, but now the study showed that before COVID-19 pandemic, the average American was getting about four hours of screen time a day. Since the quarantine has started, that number has jumped up over six hours. I think it's probably higher than that. And their eyes, people's eyes, our eyes are beginning to pay the price for that. The survey conducted by one poll on behalf of Foster Grant found that only six in ten respondents said that they often get screen related aches and pains, with the average respondent getting about three per week. And if you get that, three in four of those polls said when they take breaks from the screen and go outside and look at nature. What do you think? According to result, 57% of Americans surveyed said the pandemic had caused them to suffer from screen aches, headaches, screen aches, than before. Two thirds of those polls said the very first thing they did when they wake up in the morning is subject their tired eyes to a screen. Not only were they hurt, but six in 10 also said the uptick in screen related aches and pains leave them feeling a lot less productive than normal. Looking at screens is also quite draining, but two and three said they're looking at a screen too long. Makes them feel physically tired. Now, the first time I taught a full two-day course virtually that I normally would teach in person for the University of Wisconsin Green Bay for social workers uh, working human services around the state, I thought the first time we were given permission to teach a two-day course, they said you can dress up professionally on top. They said you can have you can just wear shorts or you know t-shirts or whatever for the summer. Uh, on the bottom. And so uh, I did that and I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I found at the end of the first day of eight hours, roughly eight hours of training with breaks, even though I could go out of the yard during breaks, I could grab something in the fridge, I found I was more tired at the end of that day than if I had been there in person. Um, and at the end of day two, it's certainly true, same feeling. You just don't get used to it. We Americans are looking at screens as much during quarantine that they finally have to take up to four breaks a day. Now, I hope you're around that much. If you're doing business, when you do business stuff, you have to. And we're going to PowerPoint presentations, so I have to take breaks. It's gotten so bad that 56% of the pundits have been actively trying to get down on screen time, rise needed so much rest. Okay, moving away from that. Perhaps some of us can sympathize with Horace Whittle. He was a dock worker in Gillingham, England. For 47 years, he hated his alarm clock. Who here had an alarm clock? Who here hated their alarm clock? Show of hands. Okay. How many of you use a cell phone for your alarm clock? Okay. Now, I still have an obnoxious sound. I need to find a better sound. But it works. It works when I travel. I'm not going to do what he did. 
On the day of Sir Tyrant, who got his revenge, he took his alarm clock to work, and he cracked it with an 80-ton hydraulic press. <laughs> he said, it was a lovely feeling. I'll bet it was. Victor Frankl once wrote, unless a man or woman wishes to drown, they, they have to be selected. In other words, you got to learn to say, how do you spell that word? No. I'm going to do it right back. I just flipped around. But there you go. You have to learn to say no. That's hard for some of us. That is to say we have to be able to, to, to be able to, win, to set down the cell phone, close the laptop, walk away from our desktop computers, turn off the television and the radio, and go outside. We need to learn to say no. Because it is in that stillness that God is speaking to us. There's a good story from years ago about a top executive with a telegraph company who went on a trip. It was extremely cold outside where he was traveling. When he arrived at the bus station, so he went to a local telegraph station hoping to get warmed up. And when he got inside, however, it was cold and he noticed there was no fire in the fireplace. And he said to the young telegraph operator, why don't you build a fire in this place and warm it up? And listen, mister, I'm too busy sending telegrams to build fires. The man then told the boy that he was vice president of a company and he wanted him to sell a telegram, a telegram to the home office at once. The message was, fire this young man immediately. A moment later, the young telegraph operator brought in a load of wood to the office and he began to build a fire. The executive said, young man, have you sent that telegram yet? And the young telegraph operator said, listen, mister, I'm too busy building fires to send telegrams. One of my favorite poems in my closing portion here has been speaking to me throughout this pandemic. And I need to remind myself, it's by way of light. And you've probably seen posts that I've done sharing this on social media. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Today I know I say this all the time, it's a cliche, that today is a gift. A package we've only begun to unwrap and enjoy and whose moments we can use to make meaning is it will come back and won't return to us. And this added value to our day. But it's true, and perhaps never, it's never been more true than right now today. I've been walking earlier, I've been walking, Grace, I've been walking a while. What do you like to open the line to that poem, Occupy Your Thoughts? What if we could see the beauty of a tiny little flower, or color in that? What if we treat and savor each moment in eternity that God has given us? What if we could stop the thoughts of worry and dread from letting clouds to invade this bright day and see the riotous beauty of spring, summer, fall, and winter teeming all around us? What if we could pull ourselves away from our electronic devices, social media generating, uh, generating devices that are creating political divisiveness, pull ourselves away and take it and take it all in? what God has given us right now. What if we can stop for a few moments the words and way we rob these moments of opportunities to love those close to us or see beauty in the small and beautiful? What if we stop? What if we could stop? What would tomorrow bring? And rejoice today to dance and laugh and rejoice with all that there in, is in us to give. Time would stand still. But we cried out God. And without God, things are missed. Love is lost. And life can become a whirlwind of meaningless activity. God speaks to us in the stillness of life. God whispers into our hearts, I love you. I am with you as you walk through these difficult times. I bring light to your darkness and purpose and direction to you when you are lost and all alone. I bring you hope when you are in despair. I bring joy to your heart 
inside. And I pray forgiveness when you crucified yourself on the altars of shame. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. When we can discover that, my friends, we will discover true abundance. We will discover that life is truly a feast. We can render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But God transcends all that stuff. He holds the door open, and God offers an invitation to his banquet table. Will we make the time to accept? Amen. Um, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are a God Sometimes we make you small. We associate you, God, with a particular political party, and you're not. We do that, we make you way too small. You're far greater than our guesses. So, God, help us to transcend all of these things, to know that you prepared a banquet for us. And when you invite us to that banquet, as you invite us even today, when we say, I don't have time, am I too busy? We thank you, God. This time, I would like to ask what prayers of joy and concern would you like to lift up? And I'll start us off this morning. I talked to Sandy Hub yesterday. So, I didn't know if you were going to say something, Oliver. We talked about you. Uh, she's having hand surgery on Monday, and then she's going to have a follow up surgery like four weeks later or something like that on the other end. So um, it's for something at the base of her thumb, you know, that makes it really painful to work. So she said, now it's time to get the surgery done. So uh, please keep Sandy Hub in our prayers. Any other prayers for concern? Christ in your mercy. So any other prayers for you this morning? So, so you can't hear that Chris has his job is being eliminated and poor mom and dad. I know we're probably listening and having to have an ear bent pretty close to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, the, the sound source. Um, March and Ken, certainly all of you were in our thoughts and prayers, uh, as others are as well. So be mindful of those we have not mentioned. Um, let's, let's sort of call everybody up in, in prayer. Those we don't know, those who are suffering, those who are uh, working on the front lines as the pandemic continues to flare and increase as we enter the fall and winter season. So, Christ in your mercy. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you simply, but you created us. Not just created us, that you love us. That you speak to us. But God, we fill up our lives with so much busyness. But sometimes, all that noise, even though you're still speaking to us, sometimes that noise distracts us. And what we think is your voice is not your voice at all. Help us, God, to be grounded in the fact that your God is full of truth, beauty, and goodness. A God of mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Help us, God, to know that you speak to us. Help us to find some, some quiet time when we can just simply be still and know that you are God. God, we humbly lift up those that we're lifting up in prayer today for surgeries, 
for continued healings for Rosie. For those for there's decisions that have to be made. For strengthening our faith, we pray for all of that, gracious God. And so many more things. And now we together pray the prayer, God, that Jesus taught his disciples by praying ourselves. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is his name, and power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Pray me richly as God bless us. You have shared your morning offering in the back. So at this time, we will celebrate those gifts in. <coughs> By way of music, special music that Mark will play.